Just a moment ago, after service, we're going to allow the children to do something. We, I haven't done it every year. I just haven't. Um, I don't know why. I probably should. But um, uh, as we showed this to you on our anniversary service, that is the bell in the bell tower. You only hear that thing. You rarely see it. In order to get that view, you've got to crawl up through dust and all this kind of stuff on your knees through small crevices. And, and uh, Matthew crawled up there earlier this year and got that and took the picture. But after service, I'm going to, uh, we're going to allow each child that wants to uh, to ring the bell as you're, as you're leaving. And some of you adults want to do it, have at it. That's fine. But, but I wanted all the kids, all the kids who want to, you can ring the church bell as you leave by getting that big old rope and tug it. I know that if I was a kid, I'd see that rope, I'd want to tug it. I would. I, it's just me. So kiddos, it's, it's going to be uh, your opportunity today, so don't miss that. All right. If you will turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2. And we're going to read verses 6 and seven, six through 7. The title of my message today is The Secret of Christmas. I'm going to tell you what it's all about today, and I hope that God's going to do something in your life today. The people, Isaiah said, walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light was dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. I love this this passage because you can't take one word you can't semantically put the Lord in a box. If you look on your bulletins, all those things written there describe him. Every ornament on this tree goes back to Jesus. These are symbols of, of things that, that, that stand for Jesus. You can't put a name on him. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's good words, isn't it? It's the truth. Now, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then finally, John chapter 8 and verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, what we have just read unlocks several things. Number one, it unlocks the secret of your destiny. This is who you are. This is who you were meant to be that is light to the world. It also reveals the meaning of life. When I hear people, they get all philosophical and mystical and say, what's the meaning of life? I just told you. The meaning of life is so simple, so many people fail to grasp it. It also reveals the hope of the world, Jesus Christ. Now, these principles to the Christian, we accept these things. We realize these things. We grasp these things through one vehicle and one vehicle only, faith. The simple faith of a child. You don't receive and grasp these things by learned understanding. You just don't. But when you receive God's promises and his principles through faith. It's the only way you'll ever get anything from God. And that's through faith. And that is so profound and simple. So many people, millions, miss it. But millions have received it. So simple, your mind misses it. But your soul gets it. What are you talking about, preacher? I want to explain it to you today. And I hope that by the end of this service, that you're going to be able to be free to receive the living words of Jesus Christ. The word of God as he says it, this is hopefully going to unlock a door, a barrier that prevents you from receiving the gifts and the promises that God has already spoke over your life. What we do to these children every Sunday, the Lord does to you every day. 
He has given you his written word. He has proclaimed things prophetically over your life. He has set your destiny and your purpose in motion. And the only thing that you need to receive that and walk in peace and power and freedom is faith. Trust. Psalm chapter 139 and verse 14. David says these very profound words. Let's open our Bibles. Psalms 139, I love this because he's talking about, uh, he's talking about the body. He's talking about what God has done and how intricate and how complicated God's creation is. But he says this, he says, he says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he says, marvelous are your works and that my soul knoweth right well. And when I first read that, I thought, what is he talking about? Your soul knows right well. All these complicated things that David didn't even understand. David didn't understand every secret in science. He didn't understand a lot of things. But his soul understood the things that God has done. This is where the mind misses God. The mind misses these principles because the mind yearns to understand the mind yearns to completely comprehend all the things of God where the word of God tells us that God's ways are beyond man finding out as high as the heavens are above the earth so are his ways from our ways so how can we ever attain the things of God well we can't but we can grasp them by faith And this simple statement, for God so loved the world that he gave. If you ever stop and really concentrate on what that really says. I was watching as Teddy was up here. Teddy struggled for his life and and through prayer and blessing, God spared him. There's a purpose for that little guy back there. There's a purpose for all of our kids. But thank the Lord God touched him and, and spared him. Now, here's the deal. If that was my son or any of my boys, I would not... Be willing to to give my child for you. I love you. I respect you. Many of you are my good friends. I really appreciate you. I brag on this church and this congregation all the time. But I'm going to tell you, if it came down to my son or you, will God be with you and may you rest in peace. Now, I love you. But that's my boy's. And it's my job to protect them and to nurture them. They are my chief ministry. Jesus was given to us by his father. His only, one and only begotten son. He so loved us. That is a love that transcends my love. It transcends your love. Nobody can love like God for God is love. What an incredible thought. What an incredible principle that he who you didn't even know. The Bible says, while I was still in my sins, when I didn't know who you were, appreciate what you did. You died for me. And for God, when his son died on that cross, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, okay, uh, we're going to die for the, the corporate world. He saw each and every individual that ever would live. And it was personal to each and every one of us. No matter how sorry, no matter how irresponsible or goofy we can be. God loved us in his great love. Now, let's talk about that mind. David said, my soul knows these principles. My soul gets it. But the mind cannot grasp these things. The mind wants to achieve. The mind wants to conquer. So when we would say, oh, I'm going to achieve salvation. I'm going to knock on enough doors. I'm going to give enough food to the poor. And the Lord's going to remember me when I die. That's not how this works, my friend. All that stuff is extra. You do that stuff because you love the Lord. You do that stuff because you're, you're one with what he wants to do. That your mind is with his and that you are acting on what his heart is doing. You don't attend Sunday school for so many years in a row, light so many candles and do these things. And I help put the Christmas tree up and I put the manger up. So the Lord's going to remember me when I die because I'm a good old boy. That isn't the way it works. You don't achieve Salvation. There are religions and there are movements out there that these people believe that if they keep doing things, if they come to church enough, they're going to go to heaven. No. It's with the heart that the mouth confesses. It's, it's, that is how we're saved is we come to the Lord by faith, not through achievement. 
The Bible says that all the good things that you do is as filthy rags before God. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. So it's only God's mercy. It's only his love that there is any hope for the world. That's why we as a Protestant church, we believe that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, lest any man should brag. But there are movements that believe that you're saved by works. You're saved by showing up. You're saved by doing certain things. No, no. It's only through God's grace. We don't attain salvation either. You can't can't just put that on your bucket list and say, got that one. It's given freely to you based on your heart. Man also tries to acquire. Man tries to earn. This is not the secret of Christmas. This is not what it's all about. The tale about Santa Claus giving you something if you're good. Well, let me tell you something. God gives you something because he loves you. It's not based on your behavior. It's not based on anything but the fact that he loves you. For God so loved the world, period. Not whether you're being naughty or nice. He just flat loves you. So can I say that God's better than Santa Claus? Is everybody cool with that? The soul of man. I want you to grasp this. The mind of man wants to earn, achieve, attain, and acquire. The soul of man believes. This isn't rocket science, friend. This is why this is for everybody. You don't have to have multiple degrees and all kind of accolades to come to Christ. He accepts and receives you as you are where you are. So man, woman, child, it doesn't matter who you are. The Lord receives you and embraces you. As an eight-year-old, I felt the embrace of Jesus Christ. Unbelievable. Never had I felt anything like that in my life. And I'd seen a lot as a kid. But when he embraced me when I was saved, it was unbelievable. It changed me. Totally changed me. My teachers noticed it. Everybody noticed what's wrong. What happened? Not what's wrong. What has happened to David? The soul believes. The soul confesses with your mouth. This is scripture. And the soul receives Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the secret Or that is the magic or the secret of Christmas. It's about believing in Jesus Christ. It's about confessing your sins. And it's about receiving eternal life. There's lots of things you can attain, achieve, and earn, and obtain. But you can't do that with Christ. You believe. You receive. And you confess. Now, I want to talk, give you a story right quick about this man named Saul who turned into Paul. Because we're going to get back to that mind and soul thing briefly. Saul's mind, Saul was, Saul was raised up a very, uh, an intellectual. Uh, Saul knew the law of God backwards and forwards. He could quote it. He was a Pharisee. He was a man who was very religious, very learned. And let me tell you something. There's a difference between religion and relationship. Oh, everybody needs to understand that. You can be very religious and not know the Lord at all. And you can prove that by, by world religions. Lots, All these people, they're very religious. They'll strap a bomb on their body and blow it up in a mall and consider themselves religious. But there's a difference in relationship. And sometimes we can get to where we, 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 we just completely miss the heart of God and we're in church. We're reading our Bibles, but we're so busy trying to understand and to attain that we're forgetting these simple things, these merits of faith. Saul was very learned, yet he was persecuting Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Messiah of all eternity. Here he was persecuting Christians. This wasn't his soul. Remember, David said, my soul knows right well. All Saul was using was his mind. Become a very religious man, very legalistic, to the point of murdering Christians that were following Jesus Christ. He completely missed the advent of the Savior. He completely missed the Lord's entrance into this world. The wise men got it. They weren't even godly people. They were Zoroastrian priests from, from, from Iran and Iraq. But because they were looking for truth, they found Jesus. And here Saul is right in the middle of everything he has been. A, he saw Jesus. He knew about the situations that were going on. And he he'd heard the history. He knew about the death on the cross. He'd heard about the resurrection. Totally missed everything, because his mind wasn't getting it. 
Paul's soul then meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 29, verses 9 through 18. We're going to read this account. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose. This is Paul speaking. He's preaching this. I was going to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He thought that that was a false God. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven. He was speaking to King Agrippa, obviously. He was testifying. He said, this light was brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Can you see how personal this is? See, it wasn't the Christians he was doing. It was Jesus he was doing this to. Friend, let me tell you something. When you harm and you offend one of the Lord's people, it's not really personal from you to those people. You're doing it against Jesus. You're touching the heart of Jesus. It's me you're persecuting. He says, now, get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. There's that theme again. And from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Wow. What a story. Jesus talks to Paul's soul. He speaks to that inner man that God is longing for. I believe, as the Bible tells us in Genesis, that God breathed into man a living soul. And it is that soul that he breathed into us that separates us from the animal kingdom, that longs for God. This is why David said, you know what? All these things I can't comprehend, but my mind, my soul knoweth right well. My soul, whom God breathed in me, is reaching for God. If you have a friend or a co-worker that doesn't know the Lord, they're in another situation or a strange religion or whatever, keep praying for them. Because I want to tell you something that's a fact. In that person, no matter how rough, no matter how callous, no matter how obscene or profane they are, they have a soul in them that God breathed into them. And that soul wants truth. That soul wants God. That's important because each time you slip and fall in front of them, it disappoints them because they want you to win. They want you to maintain your standards. That soul knows right well. These wise men, they didn't know God, but their soul was drawing them. They wanted truth, and they said, I want the truth. And the truth would set them free as they found the Christ child. That they may receive. That they may receive. This is the magic or the secret of Christmas. Psalm 63 and verse 8. He said, I cling to you. Or as King James, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. I want you this Christmas... I want you to allow your soul to touch God. You say, well, what's preventing me? Your mind. That's where the carnality is, and that's what is at enmity against God. You see, it's not the devil, guys. Let, let, me, let me illuminate some of us today. There's so many things that are blamed on the devil. And if he's guilty of everything that we blame on him, let me, let me say this, it puts him equal with God because no entity can be everywhere at once but God. 
No entity can know your thoughts or your mind but God. When you say the devil made me do it or the devil's after me, friend, there's a very good chance he doesn't even know your name. He knew certain people in the Bible that he, he gave audience to and challenged. One of them was Jesus. Your biggest enemy is your own flesh, your own carnality. And you have the power over that. I have power over the devil through Jesus Christ. But I have the gift of the Holy Spirit of self-control, of love, joy, peace. I have these things inside of me. God's given me grace to overcome my flesh. If you got the devil to blame, then you don't have a responsibility to get better. But if you have the power, if it's your own flesh, you can deal with that. God, I need help with my own flesh. Would you please forgive me? I renounce the works of my flesh. Please change my heart. David said, change my heart, O God. Renew and create a right spirit within me. David is appealing to that soul that he is talking about. He said, oh God, you know my soul wants you. Help me, Lord. He didn't say one thing about the devil. He said, against you and you only have I sinned. He said, I am responsible. It's my sin. Not some outside force messing with me. He accepted responsibility and became king. And the writer of the Psalms, and probably one of my favorite historical characters in the Bible. This Christmas, I want you to release your soul to receive. Stop trying to attain and achieve and earn religion. Dump that, okay? Receive Christ. Receive peace. Receive joy. Receive newness of life. Because he is the hope of the world. Jesus is the author of your purposes. What am I supposed to be doing as the author? He is the purchaser of your salvation. And he is the hope of the world. Merry Christmas to you. And I want to encourage you to walk in God's power. I bow your head with me and let's pray. Father, we cannot do this alone. But through you we have power to overcome any weapon formed against us. Lord, I pray that you would be with every heart and every soul. Lord, like a magnet, draw that piece of iron close to you. And Lord, what we're going to pledge to you is we're going to stop listening as much to our flesh and our carnality. We're going to start to listen for the bells of Christmas. We want to see the light. We want to receive your forgiveness and your power in our lives. So Lord, as children, we come before you, arms open and hearts wide open, Lord. And I ask that you would fill us with everything that you have destined for us to have. We receive it now in Jesus' name. All of God's children said, Amen. 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 We're going to remember what the Lord did for us. He died on a cross. That's why he came to die. We come and we are under this illusion that we're supposed to live forever. And we know we're not. But we want to. Jesus knew how it was going to end. He knew how painful it was going to be. And he knew what it would feel like to carry all of your shame and your guilt on his shoulder. Innocent, innocent Lamb of God, yet he carried every sin to the cross. Now, I'm not just talking about liars and cheaters, tax cheats or whatever. I'm talking about the worst sins and the smallest sins. Every single one of them he carried to the cross. And love is how he did it. And that's what we're going to remember what he did for us today. The Bible tells us when he was with his disciples sharing Passover.